context because you know uh, he's going to tell us about quantum algorithms for ground state energy. Thank you. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for making this conference possible, and I really also want to thank uh, everyone in the audience for being here on the last day of the conference. Uh, so this talk is going to be about quantum algorithms. Uh, so, uh, but the session seems mostly about experiments. So to make it better fitting with this session, I'll actually put an experimental result, which is not found by myself, but, but it's one that I'm very excited about. Uh, so the talk is based on going with uh, many improvements in Berkeley. Uh, so one of the most important questions in quantum computing is that can we solve a practically useful problem on quantum computer faster than a classical computer? Uh, and quantum chemistry might be one place to look for such a problem simply because of the fact that uh, quantum chemistry is quantum in nature, so it may make sense to use a quantum machine to simulate it. And the basic problem in quantum chemistry uh, is finding the ground state and also finding the ground state energy. So, uh, yeah, I think yesterday Nathan uh, said like we should look for problems beyond the ground state. Uh, I totally agree with that, but uh, ground state forms a building block of all the other tasks. So if you cannot solve this, then uh, you cannot solve any other problem as well. Uh, and so from a convection theory point of view, we have a very pessimistic picture because finding ground state energy is the worst case. However, this is not exactly what we see in real world problems because uh, in real world problems, even classical algorithms seem to work fine. Like you can get some very non trivial accuracy out of them, although they may not be as accurate as you want. So there's some, some room to use quantum algorithm to get you higher accuracy than you can from any classical. Uh, so, a better theoretical characterization of the problem may be the sky little for Hamiltonian problem. Which was proposed in this uh, 2022 paper by these two authors. So uh, this problem, in this problem, we have a n qubit local Hamiltonian H, so it can also be like a fermionic local, and we want to find its lowest eigenvalue at the zero to precision epsilon that is inverse polynomial consistent size. So this is standard formulation for this uh, ground state energy. Uh, but here we have an important assumption. Which is where this is by guiding state or good initial gas phi zero that can be efficiently prepared. And this phi zero has a uh, has a large overlap with the exact ground state phi zero. So the overlap is lower bounded by a parameter uh, is, is eta, which is inverse polynomial in the system size. So this is a highly non trivial assumption. Uh, however, it seems it's such a state is available, like uh, empirically. Uh, for example, you can use Hodgepoint. Such a state or uh, DMRG, which gives you MGS that can also be efficiently prepared. We can also use some quantum algorithms, such as like we can simulate the cooling process on a quantum computer uh, by running those algorithms for, uh, for a deep state preparation. So, all these things will give you an initial state you can use. We don't know a priori what the lower bound for overlap is, but it seems in many practical scenarios, the lower bound is pretty decent. And to, you might wonder, like with such a strong assumption, does this problem become classically easy? Turns out it's not. It's still B2B2B. B2 B2 B2. So if you can solve this problem classically, polynomial time, you can solve every other like such a factor problem, polynomial time. Uh, so we may consider different algorithms for this problem during different stages in the development of quantum computing. So in the this era, definitely we should consider rational algorithms because in this era there's a huge amount of noise, so we want to make a more kind of robust noise and uh, which we does that. But <clears throat> when we have fault tolerance, like uh, when we actually have a fault tolerance on a computer that can uh, very efficiently with the amount of noise that we can basically ignore, then we will we should consider some other algorithms such as quantum base estimation, because we could face a lot of problems of scaling up uh, to the Problem size that we actually care about. Uh, and in a fully fault tolerant setting, we will mainly be concerned about the total runtime, which is dominated by the number of non clipper gates needed in the algorithm. And at that point, we may also consider issues such as parallelization, energy consumption, and basically everything else you would consider for uh, the supercomputer we have right now. So, 
But before we reach this ideal ideal stage of having a fully fault-tolerant quantum computer, we might have some, uh, at a certain point in time, we might have some fault-tolerant quantum computer, but the error rate may still be not negligible. So at that time, we, uh, we definitely still need to optimize for the total runtime in the algorithm, but at the same time, we need to keep in mind what is the certain depth required and what is the number of qubits. Uh, so all these things will factor in into your uh, into your, your like the total resource uh, that's needed, and there may also be other factors that I did not include into this population. But uh, to start with, we need to consider certain types of number of uh, And in the fully four tolerance setting, the natural thing to use to solve this problem is just running the quantum phase estimation. So in the idealized version of quantum phase estimation, we have done whole from minus states. And we can get ground state with probability, uh, which basically uh, is eta, which if you remember is the initial order that we have. So the total runtime will be eta inverse times epsilon inverse. The epsilon is the precision you want for your ground state energy. So basically, each single run of the circuit requires time that is epsilon inverse, and you need to run uh, eta inverse number of times. But this is, however, a very idealized uh, picture of, the pro uh, of this algorithm. Uh, in practice, if you actually run the textbook version of quantum phase estimation, you will not get so nice a result. This is because in phase estimation, you don't get the uh, energies in that. Rather, you get a distribution around your energies. And this distribution has some tail. It turns out, for the textbook version, there is a heavy tail of this distribution, which gives you a worse scaling than one and you. So, uh, so when you actually implement QP using the textbook version, and the runtime will scale like the epsilon inverse times eta to the minus two rather than eta to the minus one. And the circuit depth also needs to be longer and requires a large number of other qubits. So people have improved uh, this quantum phase estimation in various ways, uh, and you can get better runtime, better circuit depth, and also reduce the number of other qubits. So you, you might ask what is the best way of doing it, and it turns out if you want to look for the optimal algorithm for solving this uh, problem, then you need to think of something other than phase estimation. So there is this approach proposed in this 2020 paper by Lian and myself, where we develop an algorithm based on uh, essentially binary search. That gives you a runtime that is like absolute words times theta to the minus one half. So this is actually the best you can achieve as guaranteed by like the very complex to lower buffer down. Uh, and circuit dash is also optimal, but we still need a large number of antenna qubits. Uh, so in the early fault tolerance setting, we optimize for circuit depth and the antenna qubit. Uh, so there's this uh, paper in 2019 by Rolando Soma that proposed a, uh, proposed a problem called the quantum eigenvalue estimation problem. So basically it requires you to compute a force graining of your density of states. So from that, we can actually compute the ground state energy simply because we just look for like, where it first, uh, first above this. And the, the, so if you just have for ground state energy, then the total runtime will scale like the epsilon to the minus four times theta to the minus two. So this is pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty bad scaling if your epsilon is small. But the circuit actually is pretty good, it's epsilon inverse, and it also requires only a single angular cooling. So that's actually what we want to achieve in the very fault tolerance setting. We want circuit depth to be low and uh, uh, the number of the to be small, but the total runtime here seems to be pretty uh, like beyond what we can tolerate. So there are a couple of other works from around the same time. Uh, yeah, so so we can use a so instead of computing the force gradient. Uh, oh, yeah, excuse me, uh, yeah, so instead of computing a force running of density of state, we can compute the cumulative distribution function of the spectral density to, uh, to actually reduce the runtime to the highest value. So basically, you get epsilon inverse scaling rather than epsilon to minus 4. So um, in Wednesday's talk, I will give, give a name to this algorithm. We call it a statistical phase estimation. So I think this is a uh, yeah, very good name. Uh, although, although here I would, I would call it the CDF based method. So you can see compared to this, to this QEP approach, we go from epsilon to the minus 4 to epsilon inverse. We keep the circuit depth, uh, 
which is an optimal serving test, and we don't be required to single and delta throughput. So this is actually the first algorithm to achieve uh, high strong limit, single and delta throughput, optimal serving attacks, these three things uh, simultaneously. Uh, yeah, so the key concept here is the cumulative distribution function. So what, what, what is that? So uh, first I will introduce some locations. We write lambda k as the eigenvalue for h, and the psi k is the corresponding eigenstate. And we can consider pk, which is the overlap between this initial state phi 0 and the case uh, eigenstate, uh, and this overlap squared. So all pk will add up to 1, so this basically give you a probability distribution. And the CDF is nothing other than just the cumulative distribution function of, of this probability distribution. Uh, so formally you can define it this way, which is you, know, if you sum up all the PK for which the normalized eigenvalue is smaller than or equal to X. You can alternatively define it using this uh, Harrison function. Um, so the important thing about this function is that it can tell us the ground state energy and it can be approximated using a quantum algorithm. Uh, so it may be clear to look at this picture. So uh, here, uh, the orange orange line is the exact CDF. So you see it's basically flat everywhere, but there are jumps. So each jump corresponds to an eigenvalue of your Hamiltonian. Uh, so basically, in order to find the ground energy, you only need to locate the first jump. And this blue curve is what we computed using a quantum algorithm. Uh, so you can see there's a large amount of noise, but the first jump is resolved very clearly. Uh, right, so, uh, and we can we can zoom in around the, the ground state energy. Uh, so here, uh, this is where the ground state energy is. Uh, so you can see the, the, the exact CDF takes a jump, uh, but, the, but the approximate CDF uh, has a kind of smooth transition from zero to something that is lower by, by theta, uh, although this smooth transition is pretty steep. Uh, so there, so this transition happens in this interval that is of size delta, which roughly corresponds to the to the uh, to the resolution of our algorithm. So uh, the the approximate CDF can be computed and satisfy this guarantee. So what it means is basically that uh, you can plot out CX, this CX and CQX as two curves on, on the two D plane, and they will be close to each other. This is how we. Uh, approximate this CDF option. So the approximate CDF can be computed using a very small circuit. It's just a, this hot test tested circuit. Uh, so if you fix, fix J in this circuit, so and what you get will just be the expectation value of this unitary, uh, which is what you do in standard hot test. tests. Uh, but if you choose J randomly, then you actually, and, and then you modify the expectation value by a by a phase vector, and you can actually just evaluate this, this function, CQ to the X, uh, with some statistical noise, which you reduce by something. Uh, and uh, so here you see a control the time illusion, but it turns out it's not, not always necessary. So if you have a reference eigenstate, then you can create an equivalent circuit to do the same task, but without control. So you just run time illusion. So this, this was actually mentioned in one of the previous talks. Uh, so yeah, actually, uh, on, on Wednesday, Oral Cabell introduced this algorithm extensively, so I will only offer like a, a rather limited introduction. And so this algorithm has been extended in various ways to deal with this other problem. So far, I've been thinking mainly about ground state energy. It turns out we can use that to compute ground state uh, observable expectation values as well, which was proposed in this 2001 paper. Uh, and uh, uh, when proposing this algorithm, we were thinking of implementing the time evolution operator using Fuller, uh, but you can implement it in some other ways, such as by uh, by dumping your poly terms in a, in a Hamiltonian. That leads to an unbiased implementation of the algorithm, so, so your, your error can be uh, like arbitrarily reduced as you increase the number of samples. So there's no systematic, systematic error in it. So this was in this 2021 paper, but Kind of a, a, a Robert, uh, uh, so, uh, and if your Hamiltonian is gapped, you can use that fact to further reduce circuit depth from epsilon inwards to delta inwards, where delta is your spectral gap. And uh, you can also add Z rotations to the, to the control qubit. That gives you something resembling quantum signal value, uh, sorry, quantum signal processing. 
uh, and this will be the actual better right time. And uh, so recent people have already also studied like how the algorithm behaves under some simple error models, and turns out it's robust, uh, robust under some, some assumption. Uh, and uh, so when we were uh, so when we proposed this algorithm, we were thinking, oh, this requires a full color common computer, and it's definitely not doable in the near term. But uh, it turns out we were wrong, and there is actually an experimental implementation of this um, modified version of this algorithm. But I think this is pretty amazing because you can run base estimation on near term devices. Uh, so in this algorithm, so here, uh, uh, those those curves are the are the approximate CDF they computed. Uh, in, in the actual experiment. And uh, you can see there's a huge amount of noise, but the ground state energy is very clearly resolved here. Uh, so they run it on a very small model with active space up to four spatial orbitals, but the precision is very high. They reach a 0 0.1 meter half to precision, which is, was, which is a chemical precision we're aiming for. So in, in this work, as I should mention, this is 2023 work by uh, Riverline. So uh, in this work, they use a bunch of techniques such as rational compilation for the time of neutron printer, and uh, they use a better Fourier coefficients. Uh, so we propose some Fourier coefficients, but it turns out it's not optimal. And they also use the error mitigation density to, 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 get, a, to get an accuracy to, to what we want. Uh, so if you, uh, if you work on uh, rational quantum isotopes, you might find this result underwhelming because uh, it seems like Problem of this size, you can routinely deal with it using uh, V2E. However, I would want to see this is a this is phase estimation, which is much more sensitive to noise than V2E. And at the same time, this is also what you want to run when you actually have a full color point computer. And that's why I find this result really exciting because it shows us that maybe running this kind of value is much closer to reality than we previously thought. And we can compare with some previous implementation of on base estimation, so this was from a uh, 2016 paper. You see those those blue dots are actually the uh, Grassi energy they got. The error is on the order of 0 0.1 Hartree. So uh, in this 2023 paper, the error is 0 0.1 minute Hartree. So this is actually a huge improvement. And a lot of factors came together to make this improvement possible, such as better hardware, better error mitigation, but I would also want to say maybe better algorithm as well. Yeah, and uh, actually a similar idea can lead us to the near optimal algorithm in a fully fault tolerant setting. So the key observation from a previous algorithm is that uh, the Grassi energy can be obtained by just computing this cumulative distribution function uh, and, uh, and, and the role locating the first jump. Uh, so this is actually a monotonously increasing function, and if you want to find the first jump, we can just run binary search, which takes a well, I've shown inverse many steps. Uh, so here, this is a exact CDF, this is an approximate CDF. So in order to resolve this job, we actually only need to uh, only need to evaluate the approximate CDF precision that is on the order of eta rather than epsilon. So this is basically the precision required for evaluating is independent of the uh, precision of the uh, of the eigenvalue we want. So this is actually very convenient when we compute the Complexity. So we can construct a circuit so that this approximate CDF uh, is a, uh, can be computed by just uh, measuring the first qubit and computing the expectation value. And uh, so this requires implementing this matrix function square root of uh, x, uh, f, fx minus top h. Uh, and this can be done using standard techniques such as quantum singular value transformation and LCU, which will introduce uh, like a Wednesday, I think. Uh, and for this quantity, uh, C2x, we actually don't directly measure it, rather we use something to estimation to estimate the square root of it. And the required procedure is only square root of eta over 2. So this square root is actually very important, that's how we get to the optimal scale. So the total run time is like epsilon inverse times eta to the uh, minus one, one half. So eta inverse is basically the circuit depth required. Uh, eta to the minus one half is the order how you get by running amplitude estimation. Uh, and this this result actually matches the very complex lower bound uh, up to log vector. 
So the lower bound was proved in this 2023 paper uh, they set up here. So this is basically the classic again. Um, so to summarize, for very fault tolerant computers, we may need to optimize for a number of metrics rather than just the run time. And uh, so this time, the matrix function based algorithms, uh, which include the statistical based estimation and the linear optimal algorithm, can be useful for both the early fault tolerant quantum computers and the fully fault tolerant setting. Uh, and so at this moment, we definitely don't know what the first fault tolerant quantum computer is going to be like. Uh, but, uh, but here, we actually have a framework uh, to optimize for different metrics. And uh, the hope is that this framework is flexible enough so that when we actually have a fault tolerant quantum computer, we can just uh, see, uh, just, just look at what the uh, specific uh, requirement we want and optimize for it uh, within this framework. So, yeah, with that, I. Yeah, I'm right. Thank you for All right, we have plenty of time for questions. So. Thanks for the nice talk. Could you comment on the recent work, how this, how this compares to the recent like, quantum concept expansion in a Q cells phase estimation algorithm? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, Q cell is a. Uh, yeah, Q cell is a. Uh, I would say, uh, um, yeah, something that builds upon this method. And uh, also, I think the main improvement of Q cells is that uh, when you have a large overlap beyond one over two, then you can you can reduce the uh, circuit depth like, uh, even further. Uh, yeah, but I think this is a more general framework where you can do a small overlap as well, say be below one half. My, my question is actually related to that. Like in, uh, if you have a simple input state like a product state, then your uh, overlap will be exponentially small size, right? So does that mean that your eta will be kind of exponentially small and you need exponentially many shots? Right, but I think the point is we don't use product state as an initial state. So there are many, many ways to prepare an initial state, such as running the MRG on the whole system. So product state is generally not a good idea. Yeah, but if you run DMRG, you kind of solve it. No, because uh, for many problems of practical interest, the DMRG will give you a large overlap, but the energy is not, not accurate enough. For example, even if you have a 0.9 overlap, the remaining 0.1 overlap can give you a significant energy error. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's for the question. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I just wanted to know what assumptions are you adding when you say the algorithm is for early fault tolerant quantum computation? Uh, yeah, so because I was thinking, like, if we, at a very late stage, say, currently when we use computer, we don't think of, well, what if there's a bit flip error, right? So at a certain point, when we, for, for development of quantum computer, we may reach a stage where we don't care about error at all. So that's what basically what I mean by fully for tolerant quantum computer. But I think there is a transition period before we reach that stage. So that's what I mean by early for tolerance. And in that scenario, we need to optimize for a number of other things rather than just one time. Uh, does that answer your question? Not really. I was wondering well, what's the assumption, like, if it's an algorithm that's for, not for fault tolerance but for early fault tolerance, then it sounds like you're adding some assumptions so that this algorithm is viable, so it's able to run. So that, yeah. Yeah, so I would say it's less about assumption, but more about the, your goals, your objectives for proposing this algorithm. Right? Does, your, does your algorithm uh, just run the shortest amount of time possible, or does it like, reduce the resource requirement? Like, this kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Right. Any other questions? Right, so let's thank the speaker again.